Okay, we're going to cover fetal development and inheritance. All right, so we covered the reproduction system <clears throat> in the last chapter, and now we're going to look at what happens with or upon fertilization and subsequent development. So when we do that, we look at different embryological stages, quote unquote, and then the, uh, the events and processes, backslash processes, we kind of bulk together. So stages kind of imply that it occurs for you know, a period of time and the events or process during that stage are listed to the right. So we have stages of zygote, morular, blastocyst, three week embryo and one month embryo. And of course it goes beyond that, but we're just going to cover through the one month. And then we have the processes that occur in this order as well. Penetration, fertilization, cleavage process, differentiation, implantation, grass relation, and organogenesis. So the first thing that happens is penetrations followed by fertilization. This occurs in the fallopian tubes about 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. You know, not far from the fimbriae, about a quarter to a third of the way down the, the fallopian tube. That's where you want to optimally have fertilization occur. So penetration of the sperm stimulates calcium release you know, um, by the zona pellucida, stimulates a change in the oocyte wall, preventing a second sperm to, to penetrate. The secondary oocyte completes meiosis too upon fertilization. Now it releases the other polar body. And now we have an oocyte, a mature oocyte completed second, um, uh, meiosis too. Sorry about that. All right, so fertilization occurs when the genetic material of both the sperm and the oocyte now kind of intertwine and interact with one another. And that stage is called the zygote stage. So that's the first stage. So we have fertilization. One sperm is going to get through the corona radiata, bind with the zona pellucida. We have a reaction that kind of separates the space between the plasma membrane, the oocyte, and the zona pellucida so that it becomes calcified in another sperm can't pass through. And then we have the intermingling now of the chromosomes of the sperm with the chromosomes of the oocyte. And that produces a zygote. So here we can look at essentially what's happening. Sperm penetrates um, that secondary oocyte. It completes meiosis too, releases the other polar body. And now chromosomes of the pronuclei intermix at number four, <clears throat> fertilization is accomplished. Then the DNA replicates in preparation for the first cleavage division. So you immediately start rolling into an interface, prophase, metaphase, interface, telophase. Okay, so the zygote stage, pump fertilization, a one cell structure is formed, and that's what a zygote is. It immediately starts to, to enter into what's called the cleavage process, which means you're gonna go through um, high mitotic division. You're gonna start to divide from one cell to two cells, two cells to four cells, four cells to eight cells, so forth and so on. And at the end of that process, we have the morula. The morula stage, occurs as a consequence of the cleavage process, the high mitotic division. And it creates a solid mass of cells. There's no cavity within it yet. It's just a mass of cells. And that kind of calcified zona pellucida to the outer surface helps it maintain kind of a single chronic shape, so to speak. So it doesn't expand too much because this process is occurring replicating over and over and over again, as it's in the fallopian tube. And so you don't want it to expand the whole size of the structure because it could become blocked in the fallopian tube and then ultimately embed in it. And now that becomes a problem or implants in it. 
So you want the size of the overall structure to stay the same, but the cells can divide over and over and over again. Thus they get smaller because they're gonna kind of be smushed in the same size overall ball size. So it's a solid mass of cells. The blastocyst stage occurs at about day five. At one end of this mass of cells, a fluid pill cavity will start to develop. And it pushes some of the cells off to one side. Sort of what happened when you had the um, mature stage of the um, secondary follicle, you know, and you develop that antrum. Fluid develops in one side, so it pushes you know, some of those follicular cells off to the side and it pushes the secondary oocyte to the other side. And eventually that becomes what is kind of ruptured and um, released upon ovulation. So a similar thing and kind of similar appearance happens here. One end is going to develop this fluid filled cavity and the other cells get pushed to the other side. And so that stage is called the blastocyst. And what happens is we start to have what's called differentiation. The cells that you began with in that mass of morula start to differentiate and become other cells and ultimately other structures. So one region becomes the trophoblast. Those are the trophoblastic cells become um, the chorion. So what were the cells to the outer periphery now become what's called the trophoblast. They ultimately become the, or the chorion, which is the fetal side of the placenta. And that side burrows into the endometrium and ultimately will start beginning uh, or uh, releasing human chorionic gonadotropin. The other group of cells becomes the inner cell mass and that ultimately becomes the embryo. So it develops into, from that ball of cells, you get a fluid filled cavity, the cells to the periphery, you know, to the end of the side that is implanting is going to become the trophoblastic cells and that ultimately becomes the orion, chorion, <clears throat> the embryonic side of the placenta, and the remainder becomes the embryo. Once it embeds into the endometrium, that event is called implantation. And that occurs about day six, you know, early six to eight. So we're going to look at a picture of how it travels because this is important. All right, so we ovulate at the ovary. We release that secondary oocyte. It becomes fertilized perhaps here at the site of fertilization. And it starts to go through the cleavage process. So the overall size remains the same here on the upper row where you see the cell with a kind of that white clear um, membrane around it. See how it stays about the same size, but the number of cells is increasing and thus the cells as they produce the daughter cells, you know, are, are smaller and smaller because they're in sort of a contained space. You know, you need that because it's traveling down the fallopian tube. If it gets too big, too fast, it'll get blocked. So about day six, day eight, right, it now arrives in the uterus. It develops that fluid filled cavity. So where D is up on the top, it says early blastocyst and then E is implanting blastocyst is that you have that blastocystic cavity there. You know, the cells to the opposite side are going to be the trophoblast cells. They become the chorion. And you see the other mass to the superior aspect that becomes the inner cell mass and ultimately the embryo. If we look in the uterus, here it travels in it and it starts to burrow in like a tick into the endometrium to the point where the upper part of that functional layer of endometrium is gonna cover it and protect it. And so it's burrowing in. So then we enter into the three week embryo stage. Now, so by about day 15 through day 21, right, that inner cell mass that we looked at now starts to differentiate also. And those cells start to move and what we call migrate. So the inner cell mass is gonna go through kind of a, a transformation. Cells will differentiate and start to move and migrate into three germ layers. 
this process or progress from a blastocyst to a gastrula, you know, which is the three week you know, embryo, is called gastrulation. So it develops into three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm. The ectoderm, which is to the outer surface, develops into the epidermis or skin and the nervous system. The mesoderm in the middle develops into all the connected tissues of the muscle, bone, the peritoneum. And then the endoderm within, endo within, develops into the linings of the respiratory system, the GI tract, and some other organs. At the end of that process, about three weeks, we enter into organogenesis, where we start to develop all the organs and thus organ systems. So that actually begins about day 21, 22-ish, before it actually becomes a one-month embryo. And the first system to develop or begin development is the nervous system with the brain and spinal cord. And that process is called neurulation. And thus, at the end of the three weeks, we start to enter into the fourth week. At the end of the third week, about day one, two, two, we enter into, we, we begin what's called neurulation, the, the development of the nervous system with the brain and spinal cord. And so some people refer to that as a neurola stage, but technically it's not a stage, but three-week embryo is. Okay, the embryonic membranes, quote unquote, that includes the amnion, you know, which is essentially the fluid, the protective layer that produces fluid, and that acts as a shock absorber, helps temperature regulate. The chorionic villi is the fetal part of the placenta that is going to um, develop a blood supply that will embrace and kind of approximate, I guess you could say, the maternal blood supply. And it's from that layer of that, those trophoblastic cells that become the chorion, you know, and ultimately the chorionic villi, which you know, is the blood supply for the, uh, the fetal blood supply for the fetus, is where human chorionic gonadotropin will be secreted. And then we have the yolk sac, which looks like kind of a yolk sac from a chicken egg. It's a yellow sac that is the source of nutrients very early in development until the placenta is developed. And also an early source of blood cells right within the first few weeks. All right, so we can see how we implant here on the left-hand side at A, and then those um, trophoblastic cells start to burrow into even more deeply into the endometrium and start to develop blood vessels. If we look at it sideways here in C, in the 16-day embryo gas relation occurring, now we can see kind of right through the middle, we have a blue layer, um, a reddish layer, and then the yellow layer. Those are your three germ layers. Ectoderm in blue on this, in this particular diagram, the reddish layer, mesoderm in the middle, and kind of the yellower layer, the endoderm. And as this develops, it's gonna pinch in, so to speak. You see that yolk sac? It will actually then kind of hang from a stalk, so to speak. And so the yolk sac being formed, you know, where early nutrients are found, makes sense that it might also contribute to the inner linings of the digestive system. Okay, placenta development. The chorionic villi containing blood vessels grow into the endometrium. Maternal and fetal blood separate from one another but are proximal enough, close enough for diffusion. So, you know, blood does not mix, but they're close enough, kind of like a respiratory membrane, where you have two layers of simple squamous epithelium, capillaries from mom, capillaries from the fetus, right next to each other. So you can have diffusion of molecules and gases from one to the other, traveling down its concentration gradient. The umbilical cord, the fetal side of circulation contains two arteries and they're here in blue because these two arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood and waste away from the fetus to the mom, right? So remember artery tells you the direction of blood flow from the fetus to mom, but it doesn't always indicate the gas content. 
Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's kind of like the, the pulmonary circulation. We said there are two areas like that, right? Fetal circulation was the second, where arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood and the veins are carrying oxygenated blood. So veins that carry blood to the heart, ultimately, are carrying oxygenated blood you know, from mom to the fetus. All right, then we enter into the one bunk embryo, and this you know, occurs between week four to week eight, when these organ systems begin developing. We begin with organs that develop into organ systems. By the end of eight weeks, all body systems are developing, limbs are visible, eyes and ears, your pinna are generally present, and external genitalia begin to differentiate. All right, so this is a model of the one month embryo, <clears throat> very similar to one of the models we have in lab. We have to the superior aspect, right? we have the chorionic villi, and then you can see the part that's maternal blood or mom's blood. All right, so you see how they're close to one another, right? but don't actually mix. Right. Then we have our, our umbilical blood vessels in the umbilical cord. We have the embryo kind of attached and hanging from a little stalk there. You can see the yolk sac. You can see the amniotic fluid in the amnion itself. And you can see how the endometrium is actually covering that embedded structure and how it's protected. <clears throat> It also increased the surface area for more or further development of the placenta around the kind of entire circumference here. Okay, placental hormones. All right, so we have human chorionic gonadotropin secreted by the chorion, stimulates the corpus luteum that back, this is the chemical signal to tell mom her ovaries those corp, the corpus luteum, the yellow bodies there to keep secreting that estrogen and progesterone so she doesn't enter into our menstrual, menstrual phase. So this is how the fetus is gonna to communicate to mom and her body and say, hey, we're here, we're embedding, you know, we're developing our placenta, you know, all systems are go, so to speak, just keep secreting that estrogen and progesterone. Detected you know, by uh, uh, seven days after fertilization, peaks around eight weeks. And then once that placenta is really stabilized, then that um, HCG is gonna drop dramatically. Okay, then we have relaxin that will relax things, makes sense, right? So when you're getting close to labor, right? relaxin is secreted and it targets the pubic synthesis to allow it to become more flexible because the pelvis has to move during the labor a process and it also targets the cervix and the inferior aspect of the uterus to start to relax and dilate. Estrogen and progesterone. Well, in early pregnancy, it's secreted by the corpus luteum so that you do not have a menstrual cycle or enter into menses. But by about the third month, the placenta itself you know, is going to secrete some estrogen and progesterone and then maintain its kind of position there. Estrogen and progesterone maintain the endometrium during pregnancy, mostly progesterone. They prepare in the mammary glands for lactation by increasing fat deposition, that's your estrogen, and keeps the cervix closed, that's primarily progesterone. Other hormones, prolactin from the anterior pituitary stimulates the milk production in the mammary glands. And then oxytosis, oxytocin, oxytocin uh, produced in the hypothalamus, stored in the posterior pituitary, released from there, stimulates the release of milk into the mammary ducts and transported down to the, to the nipple region. Oxytocin also stimulates the myometrium, the middle layer of the uterus, to contract and expel the fetus. And that is it for development that we want you to know. Right now, we're going to look into inheritance. We have 
Mendelian genetics and non-Mendelian genetics. Mendelian genetics means one code, I mean one gene codes for one particular trait. Non-Mendelian means that there's gonna be some gray area and multiple. Right, so Mendelian genetics, uh, all somatic cells contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. Right, so that's where we're starting off from. So what does it mean to be somatic? It means they're your general body cells. All the cells, you know, except for sex cells. Right. One chromosome equals one DNA plus the proteins found there. Autosome means that we are determining body traits. The sex chromosome determines gender. All right, so the first 22 pairs right, determine body traits and the last pair, the combination that you inherit from your parents will determine gender, whether it's your female or male. If you inherit an X and an X, then you're female. If an X and a Y, you're male. Alternative forms of genes are called alleles. So we're gonna go through you know, a good amount of terminology here. This is a carrier type. A carrier type is like a map, so to speak, of uh, or a display of the chromosomes. You know, your 23 pairs. So they kind of line up at the top, starting at one and ending in 23 at the bottom. Here's a normal male carrier type. So we had pair one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, said so 23 pairs. So across the top, scroll to the bottom, oh, to the lower right-hand side. That's the 23rd pair that, can, that determines gender. If you inherit an X from one parent and Y from the other, well, it would have to be a Y from dad, but an X from mom, um, that would determine the gender of male. All right, terminology. Allele, as I stated before, is the alternative form of gene. Chromosomes. DNA molecule with proteins that carry genetic material. Remember, we looked at DNA and AMP1 and RNA. The term heterozygous means when you have a pair, uh, a pair of alleles, that they are different. Uh, an example of that would be uh, the pair of 23 to determine gender in a male. You, know, you have an X and a Y. You know, they're two different alleles. They're two different alleles. Homozygous means the paired alleles are identical to one another. All right, so heterozygous means a combo pack of the pair and homozygous means identical. Genes are a DNA sequence or an area on the chromosome that determines an inherited trait. And homologous refers to the chromosomes that belong to a pair because they contain similar genes. Right, dominant, the term dominant, refers to allele, the allele that is always expressed when present. So dominate, you know, means, dominant means to dominate over something less strong, or in this case, recessive. Dominant does not determine whether it's disorder necessarily or being normal, because normalcy, you know, or what we consider normal, um, does not dominate over other forms necessarily. So dominant, or a dominant allele is a, always expressed with some kind of a capital letter. You know, it doesn't matter what letter you use, it's just capital letters um, designate or, or communicate that it's dominant and a lowercase letter is a recessive. So dominant trait is always expressed if, if present. And since you acquire two alleles, one from a father and one from a mother, they may be identical in the case of here next to uh, where it has in bold black print, dominant trait always put, you know, expressed, or expressed if present. In parentheses, we have two capital letter T's and then a, homozyg a heterozygous form, capital T, lowercase t. So the two capital letter T's are being, are, is called being homozygous dominant. Homozygous meaning they are identical letters and they are both uppercase. The, the capital T lowercase t means it's heterozygous dominant or just dominant, heterozygous form. Capital T lowercase t. 
And so when you are, the recessive is only expressed if it, it is homozygous, if you have two lowercase t's in this case. So wherever you have a capital T or, or a capital letter, if normal is supposed to be dominant in this particular inheritance pattern, then you're gonna have to be normal. However, if a disorder you know, dominates, then the disorder is always indicated with a capital letter, a T, an A or a B, whatever you choose is just a symbol. And the disorder will always be dominant and expressed. The only way to be normal would be homozygous recessive two lowercase letters. Okay, so well, you'll kind of get the knack of that. <clears throat> Phenotype means the physical expression of a trait, you know, which is the outcome of these Punnett squares that we're gonna talk about. And the genotype are the actual alleles on a chromosome, the genotype, genotype or genotypic expression, so to speak, is information we generally acquire, you know, once we've done a Punnett square. But the genotype of a parent is, okay, you know, what, you know, is the um, genotype of, um, you know, a male, the dad, you know, well, those would be the two letters on the um, kind of horizontal, superior horizontal aspect of your Punnett square. And the genotype, the two alleles that mom could potentially pass on to her offspring will be in the left-hand vertical side, generally. Technically, it doesn't matter if, dad is on top and mom is a vertical over to the left, really, as long as you just do the same thing all the time, you know, doesn't really matter because what the outcome of what comes out, uh, comes up in the boxes is going to be the same. It's just better to do it the same way all the time. All right, autosome is a chromosome type that determines body characteristics. Sex chromosomes um, are the chromosomes that determine gender. If you're XX, you're female. If you're XY, you're male. Okay, so we have different inheritance patterns. We're gonna look at the Mendelian genetics, which means you know one trait that's going to be looked at. You either have this trait or you're just totally normal. We have what's called autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. It, with the inheritance pattern, autosomal recessive, below that looks at, this means the normal trait dominates over the expression of the disorder. So whatever we, we're, you know, um, letters we're going to choose for, let's say the first, our example is going to be PKU, phenylketonuria, and so often you'll just pick a P, mm -hmm. that normal will dominate. So normal will be indicated with the capital letter and the disorder with the lowercase letter. So if normal is dominant, you know, with capital letter, the only way to get the disorder will be that the, the, offspring has it inherited two lowercase letters, homozygous recessive. Homozygous, identical letters, recessive, lowercase. That's all it's telling you. So let's say we use the letter P. Right? Normal, you would either have a capital P, a big P, little p, or two capital P's. You'd either be heterozygous or homozygous dominant. Right? So wherever the capital P comes up, that offspring will be normal. To have PKU, because it's recessive, right, the only way it's expressed is as homozygous recessive, two lowercase p's. Okay, then we have what's called autosomal dominant. Right? With the inheritance pattern of autosomal dominant, of having disorder or an ability, we're gonna, we'll talk about that in lab, like PTC testing, it's, uh, tasting it's called. That dominates over being normal. So it's gonna be the opposite of what we just looked at at autosomal recessive. Right. Now, wherever we see the capital letter, either in a heterozygous or homozygous you know, form, it means you get that disorder or you get, you know, you inherit the ability to taste this bitter substance. And the only way to be normal will be to have inherited um, the homozygous recessive alleles combination, right? 
So having the disorder of ability dominates over being normal. If you inherit, in this case, we're going to use H's because we're talking about Huntington's career. If you inherit the capital H, you will have the disorder. So if your makeup or what you inherited is either two capital H's or the combo pack um, of um, capital H and lowercase h, it means you get it. All right. So Huntington's chorea is a particular type of disorder. And usually the things, the disorders you know, that you inherited by autosomal dominance like this are usually some of the really badass ones. I'll just tell you. And therefore, normal, sometimes you get, you know, it gives you an opportunity to live to a latter age, you know, to older age. Sometimes it weeds you out and you die at a younger age. So there are generalists, a lot of the badass things. Okay. So if we're looking at Huntington's Korea or maybe PTC testing, which is you use that little piece of paper in lab and you put it on your tongue. If you taste something bitter, it means you have this ability, you inherited it. You know, and if you don't taste anything, like I never taste anything, it means um, I have the normal um, homozygous recessive. Okay, so let's say we use a capital H to represent Huntington's Korea gene because it dominates over being normal. Normal would then be the lowercase h. Okay. So if you inherit homozygous dominant, two capital H's or the combo pack, you know, a, a, a um, heterozygous form, you know, because you inherited a capital H, it means you are going to develop Huntington's career. The only way to be normal is homozygous recessive, two lowercase letters. Both autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive you know, patterns follow classic Mendelian genetics inheritance, it means you either get the disorder or you're normal. There is no in-between. One trait will dominate over the other. All right, then we enter into non-Mendelian inheritance patterns. And the following inheritance patterns means that, I uh, means the way that should be the, not they way, the way you in, interpret the phenotypes will be handled differently and based on the pattern identified. So what this means is each inheritance pattern has a different way you interpret the results. And that's why there are different patterns. And this is, you know, a few of them, not all of them, but a few of them. We're going to look at incomplete dominance, co-dominance, and sex link. So an in incomplete dominance, an example of the incomplete dominance inheritance pattern is sickle cell anemia. The heterozygous form may be a mild form of the disorder. So formally, what we looked at is that we said, look, if you have a capital letter you know, in, in what you've inherited, then you, have, you either have a disorder or you're normal. And then the other option is to have the disorder or, or um, be normal. It depends on whether you are, um, you, know, you are autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. Inheritance pattern. But here in these subsequent inheritance patterns, there's some wiggle room, not necessarily in sexual inheritance, but there's other things that happen there. So it's, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. Or gender, you know, have we determined gender? All right, so in incomplete dominance, it means one does not completely dominate over the other. There's some gray room in between. So neither allele you know, is really dominating over the other, right? right? So the phenotype is usually a blend of the two. The phenotype is the physical, physical expression, right? The genotype is what came up, the combinations that came up in the Punnett square, you know, and the background of mom and dad that determines what comes the results of the Punnett square. Mm -hmm. The phenotype is, is putting meaning to it and interpreting those results to be either a disorder, does it mean I'm normal? Does it mean, hey, 25% of the offspring can have be kind of a combination of the two? And that's what incomplete dominance means. So with sickle cell anemia, you just have to understand what sickle cell anemia is, right? Is that when it comes to sickle cell anemia, normal does dominate. So normal will be um, signified or communicated as a capital letter to indicate dominance, right? So it does dominate over being sickle cell. So when to be normal, well, we have to be homozygous dominant. 
two capital S um, letters, two capital S's. And to have full blown sickle cell anemia because it's recessive will be uh, represented as homozygous recessive, two capital letters. All right, so now we're looking and we need to look at, well, what happens when we have the mix, right? a heterozygous form, a capital letter and a lowercase letter. Because before, if you had a capital letter, you just went to you know one side or the other. But when it comes to sickle cell anemia, the mixed version, the heterozygous version, means you have a mild form of sickle cell right? and are capable of passing it on to your offspring. You may not generally display any particular symptoms, but I'll tell you that if you look at a blood smear, it will have some sickle red blood cells, erythrocytes in their smear. And it may become exacerbated and become mildly to moderately symptomatic if you go to, um, like let's say in higher altitude where you have low oxygen tension levels, that can cause those red blood cells to sickle and go into a mild, if not fairly moderate to severe um, crisis. But when you've had full-blown sickle cell, you will see almost habitually a chronic, fairly high level, moderate level of sickled erythrocytes that are that that bend and have a kind of a um, a boomerang appearance. That's the best way to describe it. Codominant is how we inherit blood. And there's one area in here that then will make sense about being codominant. An example of codominant inheritance patterns is how we acquire our blood types. Right? Two traits may be equally expressed. All right. So remember when we talked about blood, we were, we were doing blood typing in the blood chapter. If we are blood type A, it means we had A antigens on our cell surface, right? And then if we were blood type A, we automatically made you know, B antibodies. All right. So we had a antigens on our cell surface. Well, if we all do have A antigens on the cell surface, our genetic makeup, our genotype can either be AA homozygous A or AO heterozygous for A. A and B both dominate over O, but they don't dominate over each other. So if you inherit an AA, A from mom, A from dad, you're going to be blood type A. You're called homozygous. Is a. If you have an A from one parent and O from another, you will be blood type A. You will have A antigens on the cell surface, but you're considered heterozygous A. Then we have blood type B. Similar to A, if we're homozygous for B, then you've inherited two capital Bs. If we have a B and an O, we will still be blood type O, but we'd be heterozygous B, which means we have two different alleles, but both display, you know, pro, um, translate into producing um, B antigens on your cell surface. But when we're AB, remember AB means you have A antigens and B antigens on the cell surface. A does not dominate over, over B or B over A. Right? So because we have both antigens expressed on the cell surface, they do not dominate over each other. So they are considered co-dominant because both A and B antigens will be found on the cell surface. A's and B's dominate over O's, but not over each other, thus codominant. And to be blood type O, you would have to have been um, homozygous O, uh, inherited an O from mom and an O from dad. And so that's what it means to be codominant. Sex linked and sex linked inheritance, right? the genes, um, genes only appear on the X chromosome. Examples of are colorblindness and hemophilia. So these are sex linked. It's not really how you how you um, inherit a gender. Gender is going to come from you know the X and the Y, you know combination that comes up in a box. But certain disorders are linked to certain chromosomes, and most of them will be carried. Not all of them, but most of them, you know, are these that we're going to be looking at are carried on the X chromosome. Examples of which are colorblindness and hemophilia. Right. So let me just tell you, in females, you know, you said that to be female, you had to have inherited two X's. All right, and I'll just tell you that 
normal X's dominate over an X that might be carrying colorblindness or hemophilia. Mm -hmm. So in females, mm -hmm. if she inherits one normal X and one X that's carrying, let's say hemophilia, the normal one dominates over the disorder and won't be represented. So she will be heterozygous, you know, maybe what's called a carrier, mm -hmm. but she won't, you know, um, phenotypically, you know, she won't display the disorder. She won't, she won't, she will have normal vision. But if she inherited two X's that are carrying hemophilia, let's say, or colorblindness, then she will display hemophilia or colorblindness. Right? So she has to be homozygous X carrying that, you know, particular disorder, colorblindness or hemophilia. For males, not so much. X's dominate over Y's, all right? So it doesn't matter what the Y is, if that he, he inherits a um, X carrying colorblindness or hemophilia, he will have colorblindness or hemophilia. If he inherits a normal X, then he's just gonna be a normal male. Right. So an entirely normal female will appear XX. You know, a carrier female, so to speak, is totally asymptomatic, right? does not display any hemophilia or colorblindness, but her genetic makeup is gonna be an X and an X carrying hemophilia, that's the red H. A normal male, his genotype will be an X and a Y, and a male with hemophilia will be an X with an H on it and a normal Y. Okay, non-disjunction is the failure of chromosomes to separate during meiosis. It results in chromosomes either added or deleted to a gamete called aneuploidy or aneuploid. Autosomal aneuploids means there's an autosome involved. And trisomy 21, and, and that means the chromosomes, you know, one through 22. When we have an extra tri means three, of the 21st chromosome that develops or produces Down syndrome, called trisomy 21. But it can happen in sex chromosomes. And when that happens, we, did, we can develop into you know, maybe one or more of these, of these options. There are, are other combinations, but Turner syndrome is when you inherit an X and no Y, that's the O, in climb filters, you inherit in two X's and a Y, X, X, Y. So not that non-disjunction can't happen in sex chromosomes, but we're just saying that the autosomal, you know, autosomal aneuploidy or aneuploids involve the first 22 pairs and then sex chromosomes or something else. Polygenic inheritance means traits are controlled by combined effects on many genes and on skin color, eye color, hair, height, body build, you know, those are um, the product of a combination of different genes that you inherit from parent, pattern, uh, parents. Okay, and that is the end of the development inheritance notes. I'm gonna just give you a heads up, most of the questions from this area, because you know, you have to, especially with um, development, you know, you have the same cells moving and migrating and switching. Try to just kind of know by definition what's happening at the stages and at the, um, the events and processes. You know, what are your germ layers? You know, what is, you know, what is significant about the blastocyst? Well, that is the form that uh, is implanted. You know, so you have to have a blastocyst to have implantation. And then you have, you know, the next stage, you know, and then you have um, differentiation and migration and neurulation, the develop of, development of the three germ layers, what do they develop into? You know, so a lot of structure function, structure function. Once you do lab, this will make a little more sense, right? Because looking at models and things can, kinds of help, kind of helps. And repetition, of course. When it comes to this inheritance, which is the last chapter, last lab, um, that we look at um, is be able to identify um, or define the terms that were provided to you about 10, 12 terms. Give, be able to give you an example of 
the different inheritance patterns, like co-dominance is blood typing. You know, and what does that mean? You know, well, co-dominant means, well, the co-dominant part is really the AB. Everything else is one dominates over the other, A dominates over O, B over the O. And to be blood type O, you have to be O, O, right? Um, you know, what does it mean to be sex linked? What does it mean to be, you know, incomplete dominance, sickle cell anemia? What is, you know, so the normal form dominates the sickle cell anemia, you must be, um, homozygous recessive to be that totally not uh, normal. You have to be homozygous dominant. And the, the mixed version, the heterozygous form technically carries and often has some cells that sickle greater or lesser amounts, but generally not a default crisis. Okay, so that is the end of the recording.